I was 41 when I got married. I was 48 when I became a mom. That's a lot of life without someone depending on you. So it was hard for me. And, you know, I still find it a real tough balancing act. I want to just do what I want to do. And it's not, you know, I'm not proud of that. I don't think it's um, one of my best qualities. You're listening to the MILF Podcast. This is the show where we talk about motherhood and sexuality with amazing women with fascinating stories to share on the joys of being a MILF. Now, here's your host, the milfiest MILF I know, Jennifer Tracy. Hey guys, welcome back to the show. This is MILF Podcast, the show where we talk about motherhood, entrepreneurship, and sexuality, and a few other things in between. I'm Jennifer Tracy, your host, and so excited about today's episode. And this month, again, is just whizzing by. I feel like I say this almost every week, but it really is. And welcome to summer. Summer, summer. Summer, summer, summertime. Summertime. I'm really feeling goofy this morning. So <laughs> it's a, what better time to record my, my intro to episode 52? Just a quick reminder, my give for this month is familiesbelongtogether.org. You can check them out through the link on my website at milfpodcast.com in the giving page. And you can donate to them directly or you can write an iTunes review for MILF Podcast, in which case I will donate $25 to them. And our live event is coming up Wednesday, July 24th at the Dynasty Typewriter Theater. There is a link on my website uh, on the events page. You can also go directly to dynastytypewriter.com and buy tickets. I strongly, strongly recommend buying tickets ahead of time. In fact, as of the air date of this show, I don't even know how many are left. So if you want to come, and I really hope you come if you live in LA or if you're flying in, I actually have a couple people flying in just for the show, which is, I'm so honored and I promise to deliver an incredible uh, evening of performance. Please come out for that. I'm going to have four amazing moms on the stage with me talking about sex after kids. And also, by the way, you don't have to be a woman or a mom to come to the show. Like, that's definitely not a requirement. And we have a lot of listeners who are neither. It's not about that. It's just we're going to be talking about some of those things surrounding motherhood. But mainly we're going to be talking about sex. Let's see. What else? Oh, what? just one other thing quickly is that I don't know if you guys know this because <laughs> I, I do talk about it, but I don't talk about it that much. So I am also a writing coach. I love working with writers. I'm very passionate about helping people tell their stories, particularly women tell their stories. And if you do want to work with me, you can check out all the various ways to work with me on jennifertracy.com. So there's that information. And today on the show, we have comedian, writer, and actress, Kathy Ladman. Now, Kathy came to me through Joanne Astro, who was on the show gosh, I want to say back in January, Joanne was, she's the one who shared about her pre-Roe v. Wade experience in New York City in the 60s. And she referred Kathy to me and I went to Kathy's home and had this interview with her and I just absolutely fell in love with her. She's brilliant. She's an amazing mom. And I just know you're going to love this interview. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Enjoy. Hi, Kathy. Hello. I just cleared my throat. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, I'm so happy to do I'm this. I'm so excited to I be here. I loved listening to Claudia and Joanne when they were interviewed. Thank You're a great you. interviewer. Thank you. Well, I had amazing subjects. So I kind of want to just start a little bit from the beginning and find out, I know you're from New York originally. Yes. Born and raised. Mm -hmm. Okay. And... What was that like growing up in New York, in New York City, in the well, city? Well, I grew up in Queens. Okay. So it wasn't in, the, it was, it's technically in the city, but it's one of the boroughs. Right. So it was a suburb. And big family? Mm, three kids. Okay. Very common Jewish number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in the 50s anyway. Yeah. Uh -huh. Did you grow up surrounded by theater? Did you, did you aspire to? Um, well, I, my parents used to go to the theater a lot and uh, they were in, the community, like temple plays. Mm -hmm. So I was surrounded by it in, in in that way. And they had comedy albums and I started to listen to them when I was really young, when I was eight about. And one of them I really, really hooked into was Nichols and May, Examine mm -hmm. Doctors. 
And I just fell in love with it. It just became uh, my thing. I mean, it was just, I, I can't explain it. It was very sophisticated for an eight-year-old to yeah. enjoy Nichols and May, but yeah. I, I just loved it. And I memorized the whole album. I still have the album here. It's it's uh, autographed by Mike Nichols. I, I've yet to get Elaine May's autograph. Wow. On it. Yeah. I, Good thing you got Mike Nichols. <laughs> I know. And I worked with him twice also, which was amazing. Wow. But um, I memorized the entire album. And when I went to sleep at night, my mom would come into my room and sit on the edge of the bed and I'd say my prayers, which sounds so queer. And um, and I mean queer in the sense of the word that I used that used to be used, not queer gay. Right. The word's been usurped, I believe. Yes. You know, it's been repurposed. Yes. And so I said my prayers and then I would do a selection off the album for her. And she didn't understand what I was doing. What would she say? What was her reaction? Oh, nothing. Just like, oh, okay. You know, I mean, it was just very, <laughs> something very anemic. It wasn't, uh, yeah. I don't recall, I don't recall being encouraged in any way. Right. And I wasn't encouraged in my family. Even when you got older? Yeah. I wasn't encouraged. So when you grew up and graduated high school, what was your next step? Well, I went to college, but I, I really wanted to be a comedian. I mean, I decided when I was 13, I wanted to be a comedian. So I went to college, but I, as as the as it approached in my life, I got more and more nervous because it was you know it was getting times for me to actually do it. Yeah, I had no encouragement around me. I mean, I I had, if anything, discouragement. Yeah, you know, my mother told me to to you know I was majoring in uh, not theater but cinema, and I did an inter interdisciplinary major of you know, communications and and. She said, I think you should get a teaching degree just to fall back on. So I did that immediately. You uh -huh. know, I was scared. I was sure. really scared. And it took me a while. It took me until I was almost 26 to start doing stand-up. To get on the stage? No, I got on the stage before that. I okay. got on the first time I got on the stage, I think I was uh, 21. I was, te I was a teacher. I was an eighth grade English teacher. And I knew I didn't want to do that. I was in, outside of Philadelphia. And... Um, so I, I went to this open mic at this place in Philly, and I did it two weeks in a row. I went to California for a vacation that summer, and I decided I was going to move out to Los Angeles and do it. Because New York was so close, I think it just almost seemed like too viable. So I thought, well, the reason I'm not doing it is because I'm not in Los Angeles, so I'll move all the way across the country. <laughs> and so I did that, and I didn't go near a comedy club, and I lasted in L.A. for four months that time. Came out here. Didn't go near a comedy club, not in anywhere near the stage. Then I got into a car accident. And I was fine, but the car was a mess and got the car fixed. And I moved back to New York and spent four, three to four miserable years before I found the courage to start doing stand up. And that, that was great. And once I started there, I didn't stop. I didn't turn around. Was there an impetus to the moment when you got the courage? Or Well, I was, okay, Jerry Seinfeld was my first boyfriend when I was 15. He was 16. We met on a, a tour, a, a, like a, sort of like a teen tour, but not as vapid as that. It was a, more of a work tour. So he was like my first love. And we used to talk about comedy a lot. And he started doing it before I did. And and when I saw him on The Tonight Show the first time, I called him immediately and told him how great he was. And he came to New York the next week and I made him dinner and we went around town. You know, he was doing sets at the different clubs. And I told him that I really wanted to do this, but I was scared. And he said, you'd be great. And he mentored me. You know, he just said, he just communicated with me and held, kind of held my hand. And so that, and I took a stand-up comedy class which really was helpful. Yeah. Just getting up and, and, you know, talking into a microphone in front of a room full of people. Yeah. I started on, um, I think it's June 28th or 29th, 1981. Uh, never looked back. Wow. So you you got the support that you weren't, that you didn't have yes. from your family. Right. From, from Jerry. From Jerry. Right. What a, what a source. That's right. an amazing source. Right. I know. Wow. Lucky. But and you trusted it. You trusted him. Yes. So you I did. said, okay, well, if he's saying this, I'm going to go for it. Right. That's awesome. Yeah. That's and so awesome. I was not able to find it in myself. You know, there are people who are. Able, I'm not one of those people who is able to find that strength in myself, and I've. And that's something that 
you know, it's from my upbringing, a kind of very insecure at, by nature. That's interesting because it takes so much security. And I always say it takes a lot of ovaries. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of ovaries to get on the stage night after night after night. And like, I mean, Claudia in, in her episode shared that she had a drink thrown at her like when she was on tour. Oh, God. You know, so I know like, so it's both like you. Yes, I believe you that you have that in you, but you also must have. A, a deep sense of self that you I just... I must have it someplace. Yeah. I mean, it has to be someplace. It's a lot of struggle. I yeah. mean, like right now, I'm I'm embarking on a solo show about my eating disorder. And that has... I've been working on and off uh, for 18 years mm. on this show. Mm. And it's really a whole different venue for me and a whole different approach. And it's not stand-up. And it's not, certainly not f all funny. You yeah. know, some of it's going to be funny, but it's tragic stuff. Yeah. And it explains a lot about me and who I am and why I f found the need to control so much because I w had no autonomy when I was growing up. So that is something that I'm working on right now, which is pretty fucking scary. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. That's I can't wait to come see it. Oh, thank you. Uh, that sounds amazing. I hope it's good and yeah. I hope the message is clear yeah. and I hope it's entertaining. So you did stand up for a long time and you toured and you were on shows and right. and then you were also acting at the same time, mm -hmm. getting m TV and movies. Mm -hmm. I mean, you were busy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're really busy. Uh, yeah, and I'm still busy, yeah. but but not as much stand up. Yeah, as I used to be doing. Yeah, and you know it's weird. I was at the comedy store the other night. I had a spot in the original room, and I used to love that room. I mean, it used to be my favorite yeah. room to play. Yeah, and now when I go there, I feel such trepidation. And the and the crowd was really young, and I had an awful show the other night, and mm. it felt terrible. And it felt like maybe this is the world telling me that I should stop doing stand-up. And then Saturday night, I had this great show someplace else. Mm. And still, after 38 years, a bad show can really rip into me. Yeah. You know, you'd think that I, I would have built up a callus for that, but it's still really hard. It's really hard. Well, but to me, that speaks to how good you are at what you do because you make yourself vulnerable on stage and you can't have it both ways. You can't make yourself vulnerable on stage and be it's raw true. and real and also have a wall up. I it's don't true. think. No, I think that's true. So I, I get it. I mean, it makes yeah. sense to me. And I think that that will behoove me in my show. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So somewhere on this journey, motherhood came to be for yes. you. Yes. And this is a very interesting story, so I yeah. can't wait to... Well, you know, I was single for a very long time, and I met my husband in, like, 1988, I think, and we were friends. We became fast friends. He was married, and he had two kids, and we were friends for a few years, and then his marriage broke up, and we fell in love. I mean, I, I, I always had... Like, I remember talking about him in therapy and saying to my therapist, I wish I could meet someone like Tom Frickman. Oh. He's so great. Now that I'm married, I can tell you some things that aren't so great. <laughs> of course, that's always the way it goes, right? Oh, my right? God. Yes. I mean, the other night, I wanted to watch, uh, I taped Free Solo. Oh, so good. I'm, I'm in the middle of watching it's it now. So good. It's amazing. And I started, I told him, I said, I taped Free Solo so we can watch it tonight. This is Saturday. And uh, we came back, and the opening shot is... Of, I forget his name too, but yeah, I can't remember. But of him climbing, yeah, you know, on on a sheer wall. Uh, Tom said, "I can't watch this." I said, "Why do, does it? Is it too upsetting for you?" He says, "No, because he's he's stupid and I can't watch <laughs> it." I said, "What?" I said, "Yeah, he's stupid. Anybody who does that is just stupid, and I just have no desire to watch it." <laughs> and I was like, "My God, are you that?" Aren't you curious about something that's such a pheno phenomenal feat? Yeah. No. <laughs> He's stupid. <laughs> and I said to him, I said, well, I guess you and I aren't going to be taking a trip to space anytime <laughs> soon. You know, I, they, I, they said there were so many things that I'm going to be doing in my life that we're not going to be doing together. And <laughs> that was really, that really. What did I you end up that. watching instead? Oh, what did we watch? We watched Bill Maher. 
from Friday Night, which okay. was a good show, and he had a great piece about, um, you know, Trump's CPAC speech that was like two yeah. hours, or yeah. two and a half hours, something yeah. like that. So it was a, a they, they did a bit about selling a video, a set of DVDs of him, and they showed the highlights of it. It was, it was really funny. It was like you know, it was any ad you would see for a DVD yeah. set, and uh, and That's it was funny. it was done so so well. We laughed out loud. So then I started watching Free Solo last night by myself. Oh, good, good. No, wait, is your husband a stand-up also? He was a stand-up. That's how we met. Okay. We met doing stand-up in Minneapolis, and he was the feature act, and I was the headliner. And we became fast friends. He was just a great, smart, funny, uh, political, which I wasn't really, and he really awakened me. I mean, I wasn't apolitical, but I just wasn't... um, so involved. Yeah. And I'm so much more involved. I think everybody's more involved now. Right now. I mean, oh, for sure. Yeah. But I mean, since I met, since I've been with Tom. And how long is, have you guys been together? We've been friends since 88 and then 88 or 89. And then we, we've been together since 93. Wow. Yeah. Did you guys get married? We got married in 96. Okay. And I didn't think I was going to have kids. He has two kids. And I thought, okay, I'll have stepkids. And right. they, they grew up in Minnesota and they would come here to visit. Yeah. And they're great kids and we get along really well. Yeah. But then I I was in my mid forties and I had great health insurance. I had all three unions. I had After wow. SAG and Riders Guild. Oh. And I thought, hmm, they have insurance for fertility treatments and I think I want to try this. So we talked about it and and we embarked on this. Mm. Now, while I was doing this, I was somebody, actually a therapist of mine at the time, hipped me to families with children from China. Mm-hmm. They were having this uh, Chinese New Year's banquet mm-hmm. at a church in Chinatown. It was, it was small. It was really small. And we went there and they actually had Panda Express food. It was, te- it was awful. So terrible. I know, it's terrible. Oh, my God. But it was so amazing to look at all these little girls in their silks. And at the end of the banquet, they put they rolled up bubble wrap on the floor and they jumped up and down on bubble wrap and it sounded like the firecrackers. Mm. And it was so cute. And we spoke to some families there. And when we were walking back to our car, I said to him, I said, you know, I really, I really hope that I don't get pregnant. I like this. And I didn't produce enough follicles. I only produced four follicles with all the um, shots. And he had a vasectomy, and they were going to have to aspirate sperm from him. So it was just not worth it. So we yeah. used we used some donor sperm that, that we had gotten as backup. Mm-hmm. And I tried that for a few months, and it didn't take. And um, in the meantime, we started the process. Wow. And how long did it take the adoption process? It took a little longer because um, I got real, I have depression. And me too. Um, yeah, I mean, I've had it for pretty much my whole adult life yeah. since college. Me too. So I was managing that and it was recommended that I didn't, uh, I stopped the process. So we stopped the process and then we. Be- and I'm sorry to interrupt yes. you because of the hormones might cause more depression and, and make it worse? Was you that- know, maybe that was it. I didn't even think yeah. of that. I think it was after I was finished. But who knows what was still in my system. But right. for whatever reason, my depression really ramped up. I mean, w- my work was changing dramatically mm-hmm. at that time. It really like went off the edge, mm-hmm. you know? It just, I was working, 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 and all of a sudden there was no work. Do you think that had to do with your age as a woman? I think it had to do with... I mean, there were a lot of variables. It had to do with the how long I was in the business. It had to do with the, the road kind of fell off a little bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was like there was a big comedy boom when I started. Right. And it kind of fell off in, in the early to mid-90s. Yeah. So I got really depressed, and they suggested that I stop the process for, for now, which I did. And then I we picked it back up in a couple of years, but then we, we had to redo some stuff. So... The, so it took us way longer than no, normally it should have taken about a year and a half. Yeah. But for us, it took about four and a half years mm. just because of the time that sure I was doing writing jobs on, on a couple of TV shows at the time. So that helped. And were you getting treatment like out like um, medical help oh, for yeah. the depression? Okay. Oh, yeah. 
Yes, I was. But, you know, with depression, you know, it's yeah. not... Like, my, I remember my psychiatrist saying to me, it's not an exact science. Yeah, it's I said, not. but it's science. <laughs> I know. I'm hoping someday they'll be able to, like, take some of your blood and then go, you know, oh, you need 20 milligrams. Of the, know. You know, but they just can't. They have to just feed you these things and see how you it feel. It really is like pin the it's tail crazy. on the donkey. Yes. I mean, you'd think it was... You'd think it would be a little bit more exact. You know, I mean, that's the kind of... Fa- I guess that's the kind of faith I have in science. Yeah. So four years... So yeah, it took it took about four and four and a half years, and um, we started in the late nineties. We started in the late nineties, and we ended up going there in going to China, going to China in two thousand four. And what was that experience like? Start start with the you'd gone through the adoption process, then you get the call. I'm sure there were many calls. And well, there weren't that many calls okay. actually. You get the referral, you get a package when you, they give you a, like a, expected it around this time, you know, so you're heightened, you're, you're heightened on a heightened alert. And so we get the thing in the mail and we get her pictures. Uh, this is your, this is your baby. Oh my God, I just got chills everywhere. And then we started working on the name and then we get the call. You get the call about two weeks prior. This is when you're flying. How old was she when you got? She was 11 months. Oh my gosh. What they think about her is that she was with her um, birth mother for a, a couple of months, one or two months, I think. So she was probably breastfed, which is good. But she was in an orphanage for nine to 10 months. So, um, you know, there was, it's interesting. She's taking Chinese now in high school and she's taken to it really well. Mm-hmm. You know, she's good at it. And it's it's amazing to think like, she she heard this like she heard yeah. this all the time yeah. when she was in, in that the orphanage. Womb. Yes. Yeah. So who knows what what she has in her sure. her what her affinity is. Yeah. Sure. So um, yeah, we went there and it was a pretty insulated trip because we went there with we flew there with thirty one other families um, who, who were either couples or had kids with them uh, who were going to adopt, and then we split into. I think it was three different groups, and we 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 go to you go to Guangzhou, which is where a lot of the government stuff is for the adopt all the adoption paperwork that kind of stuff is there. And one of the groups stayed around there. Another one flew someplace else, I forget where, and we flew up to Nanjing. That's where we got Milan. That's where we picked Milan. her up. Yeah. Wow. And what was it like when you first saw her? Well, it was weird. Um, we were in a lot of government buildings, I and mean, we didn't do a lot of touring. I mean, we were on a bus and stuff. Yeah. We didn't get a real feel for. I mean, I want to. We want to go back to China with her, and really visit. So we're in a government building. This is what happens. Okay, we fly out of L.A. on a Sunday night. We arrive to to uh, Guangzhou on a Monday. Maybe we arrive on no. We arrived on a Sunday. We stayed overnight in Guangzhou. We flew the next morning to Nanjing. Like three hours later, we had our kids. Oh my gosh. I know. It was it was insane. So we walk into this building. We're waiting and we see there are some women who have babies with them. And they're, they're the um, caregivers. And there's this baby sitting on the couch. And I didn't have my glasses on. And I, I guess I need distance glasses. I mean, I do need distance glasses. Yeah. But I didn't think my eyes were that bad back then. But bad enough to not really see features. Yeah. And Tom said, there's Milan. Oh, he recognized her sitting on the couch. So we were like, I think we're like third parents up. They did us one at a time. They called our names and we each were given our babies. And then we all waited and it was hot and sweaty. It was so hot. Oh my God. Mm. Then we spent a, a week in Nanjing. We had to do some, a lot of paperwork there. Right. And in the meantime, we went out, you know, we went on meals together. We toured together. We, you know, we did, we did stuff together as a group. Um, we did some interesting things. We went to some sites and did some great shopping. I one of my friends from the trip is a um, wardrobe person in in the business, and she loves fabrics. Mm. So we went down to the district where they have textiles. Oh, I bet and it was gorgeous. We walked through. Oh my god! And I bought some yarn, some cashmere yarn on a spool. I still don't mm. know what I'm going to do with it, but it's like amazing. It was so cheap, and the fabrics yeah. were gorgeous. I mean, it was oh. It was so much fun. So that that to me was like one of my favorite outings that I did actually. Yeah. It was off the beaten path. So we spent a week in Nanjing and then we went back to Guangzhou where we had to spend another week 
to do more bureaucracy. And then finally, you know, you got the medical, we got them checked out by doctors, blah, blah, blah. And I remember one family, they found out that their daughter was deaf. You know, at this point, you can make a decision as to whether or not you want to move forward. I know. Can you believe it? Mm. And they moved forward. And it was interesting because I think the wife's, one of the wife's relatives was deaf. And it, it just it just all made sense yeah. in their lives yeah. to move forward wow. with that. I know. Ugh. Pretty intense. Pretty intense stuff. The food was not good. Really? The food was terrible. At least the food we had was terrible. Oh. I mean, we were we were just in, you know... One part of, we didn't go to Beijing, right. we didn't go to Shanghai, right. who, who knows? I mean, I would really want to go to Shanghai. Yeah. The best meal we had was a Vietnamese meal. <laughs> and there was a blackout in the restaurant at the time, and it was so fun. And they turned on fans, and it was in the dark, yeah. and, it, and it was fun to see Milan going through it. It was, oh, she was so cute. She oh. was such a cute baby. So you bring her home, and you're a new mom. Yeah. Suddenly. I know. I don't think I really knew what I was getting into. <laughs> no, but I don't think anybody Nobody does. Nobody does. Yeah. yeah. How was the transition? It was hard for me. Yeah. It was really hard. I'm selfish. I am. You know, look, I was 41 when I got married. I was 48 when I became a mom. Yeah. That's a lot of life without yeah. someone depending on you. Yeah. So it was hard for me. And, you know, I still find it a real tough balancing act. I want to just do what I want to do. And it's not, you know, I'm not proud of that. I don't think it's um, one of my best qualities. I'm nodding and eye rolling in, in agreement because I struggle with that so much. And I've shared this on the show is that yeah. I love my son more than life. And I just, ever since I've been divorced, I'm like, I cherish my alone time. Oh my <laughs> like, God. I just I cherish love being it. Alone. I love, I need to recharge. I'm definitely, I and I just recently learned this phrase, but I'm definitely an introverted extrovert. What is that? So you might be also too, a lot of performers are, where it's like you can go and perform and do that and you can do the social thing, but you need your alone time to recharge. Like right. I have to have my time where right. it's just me, no partner, no friends. Mm -hmm. You know, my my dog is fine. Oh, my, dog my dog's is fine. always fine, yeah. yes. But I need to read. I need to watch a documentary that I want to watch. Right. It's just me. And right. I, I have to have that. Otherwise, I start to unravel. And for me, that's where the depression can kick in. Overwhelm. Right depression. Right. And then I feel like I'm drowning. Right. And with a small child, <laughs> you know, there's just no option unless you're very fortunate and you have a big family and they can take yeah, care of it. Yeah, we had no support system yeah. here, you know, like you had, no, we had no relatives. You know, I talked to friends who have like grandparents, oh. and, you know, even if we were near there, my parents were so old, you know, right. you know, right. by that time they weren't about to like step in. And very different bringing up a kid without a family support system. Yeah. Very yeah. different. Yeah. Um, you know, we never went out. Yeah. Did you have a little bit of postpartum? I don't know. Was it that? I don't know. I'm, I am not a doctor, but like to me, you know, and there's been research done about this, that just that being a new mom and having that stress and taking care of a small baby, whether or not you gave birth, whether or not you're breastfeeding, you can definitely experience that postpartum right. because it is about that crash of like, who the fuck am I? I love this little baby, but oh my God, the, the responsibility is crushing. Yeah. I remember one time I was holding my son. I still shudder when I think about this. He was like maybe four months old and I was holding him in the kitchen and there was a fly in the kitchen. And I was like, come on, I can't touch fly. <laughs> you know, and I, t I was holding him in one arm and I had him like, and he was little, he couldn't, he was little, he wasn't able to like hold on to me yet or whatever, mm -hmm. you know? And I took a towel, a dish towel, and I was swatting at the fly, swatting at the fly. And I remember his head, he started leaning back. I had his legs mm -hmm. and his butt, his head started leaning back and the countertop was right behind oh, him. Oh God. And I caught him just in time. And I still remember that moment and thinking, my God, I could have. He could have died, like smacking the back of his head on the countertop. Oh, God, you know what I did one time? Our dog, Preston, our first dog, ran out. Somebody left the front gate open where we were, and he ran out, and I was freaked, and I was home. I had just come home from Trader Joe's, so I'm packing groceries, so I grabbed Milan, and I'm running in my clogs, 
and <laughs> I tripped. Oh no! And I fell on her. Yeah. And the pave and the pavement was. Oh. I know. Terrible. I'll tell you my favorite thing is like for a couple of years, I didn't feel like going back to Minneapolis for Christmas. I just wanted like some downtime. Yeah. So Tom and Milan went and I stayed home with Jeffy. Heaven, heaven. Watched screeners. Yes, that's my favorite. <laughs> went to the movies on my WGA card. Yeah. It was so great. That's just, that's what I mean. Like that restorative time. Yeah. Is I so- love, I, I think, I wonder if that's why I love that time of year. Because mm. it, it just reminds me of everything's shut down. You can't do anything. You Half the population of LA is gone, so you right. can actually drive. Right. right. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. So anyway. So uh, how yeah. I want to ask you how it was, is the term, and educate me here because I don't know, is it adoptive parent? Or what? People, I guess it's an adopt. Yeah, it's an okay. adoptive parent. Yeah. How was that for you, like with family and friends? Were they like it was a no big deal? It was no yeah. big deal. My sister has two adopted kids, mm-hmm. but domestic adoptions, oh, okay. not international. Mm-hmm. It was no big deal. Yeah, it was really no big Cause deal because it's. At all. I mean, it's so common. Yeah, and um, also we live in an urban city where it's like people yeah. are, you know. Yeah. yeah. No, was, I think the biggest challenge. For me, was that I was so much older than all the like most of the parents, right? That like I a was meeting or a baby class or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were mistaken for Milan's grandparents, and we, you know, we could be if you do the math. We right. could be right. But then everything else just went along. You just she she got went into preschool, and you were part of the. You know, it was like yeah, yeah. It was it was fine. Yeah, it was fine. And she's an amazing kid. Oh my gosh, she's an amazing kid. What is she into? She loves music. She loves music and she loves softball, although she's liking softball a little bit less, but she really loves her music so much. Like she plays instruments? She plays plays viola and she plays percussion, which she's really enjoying more than viola. Viola is her first instrument, but she loves percussion. That's impressive. She's very talented. And she's 15? She's 15. She'll oh be 16 gosh. in August. Oh, my god! I know. And she's not driving. She said she doesn't have her permit yet. She doesn't. I don't you know think what she's in a hurry. You know what? Those kids now don't. And they have Uber and Lyft and all this. And I, I, I think know. it's, I mean, I I wouldn't want to either in No, LA. I mean, we let, her, we let her drive like down the block sometimes, yeah. uh, like on a parking lot yeah. or something like that, yeah. you know, just to give her a feel of it. It's fine with me. I'm in no hurry. Yeah. It's just, you know, sometimes you have to, you have to pick me up. You got to take me like this afternoon. I have to take her all over the place. And, you know, oh, it's still, it's still a chauffeur. Yeah. It's yeah. still a lot of, a lot of my time is, um, taken up by that. And, yeah. and, you know, my husband's the one with a full-time job now. He didn't have a full-time job when we, when we first adopted, uh, Milan. So we were really more evenly co-parenting. Mm-hmm. Since he's the one with the full time job, what does he do now? He's, he's a, in. He's a builder. Okay. He's he's is not a stand up comic anymore. He was a writer for a while, and now he's in construction and he does these high end residential cool. renovations. Yeah, he's working right now. He's working a project in the Wilshire Corridor. Oh yeah, you know, a penthouse. Oh wow, sixty seven hundred square feet. That's sixty seven hundred square feet. Wow, I know. It must, is it the entire top floor? It's, it's two floors, actually. <laughs> they're in their 80s, these people. So I don't think they're going to be using the um Whenever I hear that floor. kind of square footage, I think, oh, it's so much to clean. I know. I mean, I don't <laughs> so even clean this place. Vacuum but, and, like, um, mop. Oh, my and God. Just... I think when you, when you have that, I mean, right, you I, have a person. You have somebody right, coming course, in a, or a team. Right. But I, I often think of that, too. It's like, how do you keep up with that? <sighs> My sister lives in a big house on Long Island. Somebody comes to clean her place like three times a week. Oh, yeah. That's but n- not, she doesn't like clean the whole place. No, little each bits time, at little a time. Little bits at a time. But three times a week, she has somebody coming. And I like. How luxurious is that? That sounds luxurious. But again, with the introvert thing. Yes. That I've just learned. I never would have thought of myself as this way, but someone expl- explained yeah. it to me. So I don't even want someone in my space that often. I know. <laughs> no, I know. I mean, like when. My housekeeper comes, it's like I have to hide. Yeah, I have or to leave. Go into an, like, yeah. I don't want to be here because my place is, is small. And I know. I it's funny. It's funny. I mean, it's such a quality problem, my God. But I know. When did you always just tell Milan about her adoption? Yeah. How did oh, yeah, that work? We were always very yeah. open about it. I mean, yeah. and, and 
But there was never a time when we sat down and said, right. had, had a talk. Right. Right. You know, right. it was just a, something that was part of our yeah. conversation always. Yeah. You yeah. know, when you were a baby in China, blah, blah, blah. I mean, yeah. I can't even remember what we said, but we were always very honest yeah. with her. That's so great. No announcement. Yeah. I think that's, <laughs> for me, that's how I parent with all all things, you know? Yes. Because I just think it's so much easier than having some big surprise. I know. You and, know? you know, like I've talked, to, we've talked, to, I, I personally have talked about pot with her yeah. for a while now and have asked her if she's if she's tried it. Yeah. And she says no, and I believe her. Yeah. Um, she says a lot of, most of her friends smoke pot. Yeah. And I said, just do me a favor. If, if you're going to, come to us first. Yeah. Because, you know, the last thing I want is for her to smoke pot with a stranger. Yeah. And it's such strong pot now. Yeah. That I just don't, you know, I don't want her having a, yeah. a shitty experience yeah. with that. Or being in an unsafe environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we talk, I mean, we talk, she said she has seen people shoot heroin in her school. What? I, I shouldn't be shocked by that, but I just, wow. And what about sex and boys or if she's, she's is she into? Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. She's not there yet. Yeah. I wasn't either at that age. I really wasn't. And I remember having all these girlfriends who were just boy crazy yeah and all they did was talk about and i would do it to fit in right but i just was like mm, you know i'm more interested in like being in the play and you know the, right. the jazz acapella jazz group i'm in or right. i don't know i just wasn't it wasn't even in even in college i, I don't know i, and I, I, I wasn't thought something either. was wrong with me oh really oh i really did i really oh, yeah. i i mean i wasn't either um in college i started that is where I started my my sexual life. Yeah. But at high school, I was just, well, I was miserable. I hated living at home. And I did whatever I could to get out. Mm. I accelerated through school and I graduated when I was 16 and I went straight to college oh, two wow. days later. Wow. Yeah, I graduated in the middle of the year. You were done. I was so done. Yeah. I was so done. Yep. And where'd you go to college? Um, Albany, New York, State oh, University nice. of New York. Oh, beautiful. It was nice. Yeah. That's a great was, place to I had go a, to school. I had, a, I had a great college experience. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. I loved college too. Yeah. I, I, I went to Boston to BU and uh -huh. I, it was just, it was fun. In fact, when I, my baby was three months old, mm -hmm. my husband, that my ex-husband now, but then husband was on a show in Boston and we went and I just. It was October. It was beautiful, and I walked around, oh, and it was so nice. interesting being in the place where I was had my formative years with my little tiny baby, and oh. like walking around the commons, and yeah, it's just amazing. It's beautiful. It's, it's there's a lot of history there. I mean, I I love the Northeast. Me too. I really do. Me too. I was saying that I really loved college, although that's where my eating disorder began. I had you know a trauma that really uh, set me off. Can I ask what it was? Oh, sure. It was, a, it was a best friend I had who all of a sudden decided she didn't want to be my friend anymore. And I, I just couldn't bear it. Yeah. And that we were on diets already because I, I weighed too much and, and she wanted to lose weight. And then we went to this quack diet doctor mm. and um, got these pills mm. and we're taking the pills and then... Um, then that happened and she dumped me and I really decided I'm going to be the skinniest person. Mm. Uh, that's what I want to do. Mm. I want to lose weight and be the skinniest person. I wanted to take, get, take some control of my life. Yeah. You know, that was something that was, nobody was ever going to do that to me again. No one was ever going to pull the rug out from under me again. I was going to be in control. Yeah. So I took complete control of that. And did you still use the pills or were you just very restrictive? I was using these pills. They were non-amphetamines, but they, you know what they were? I was looking them up. They're called Ionamin and they're Fenfen. Oh my gosh. I was taking those in the 70s. Wow. Yeah. I took them as, you know, in very measured amounts. I didn't, I didn't take them every day. I really wanted to make them last. Yeah. So I, so I took them like maybe every other day and then I was restrictive. And then over a period of a lot, I mean, a lot of this is in my show over a period of, let me see, this was 75. So over a period of about two years, I lost close to 40 pounds. Oh my God. Yeah. 
And you were 18? I, I was, no, I, at that time I was about uh, 20, I was like 19 to 21, oh my this gosh. period. Yeah. I went from like 127 to under 85 pounds. Well, maybe I wasn't under, I was about under 90 pounds at that point. And you yeah. were able to function and go to class and pass your classes? And- yeah, I mean, oh yeah, I was able to do that. And then I was a teacher. I was a teacher. Oh, that's right. Because you had already this. graduated because you went to college at 16. Right. Did your family chime in and say? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, you know, anorexia was not really part of the vernacular right. back then. Right. And it w- there wasn't a, as much known about it publicly, certainly. And it was just being studied. And, and so my, my mother was, uh, you know, would would say things to me. But anything that my mother said to me was of like course. poison. Right. So I just ignored her. And then my sister would occasionally say something to me. And I reassured her that nothing was wrong. And I really thought that I was, I was you know, I right. wanted to believe that nothing was wrong. Right. I wasn't, I mean, I wasn't, I was, I was lying. I was lying, but I think I was lying to myself as well. Yeah. And how long was it before you got better or had an event or something that... Well, we went to family therapy in 1978, and that started me on a good path. And then I started doing stand-up, which really helped me in my recovery because I was doing what I wanted to do with my life. That made a big difference. Mm. You know, before I was working jobs that I didn't want to work, I mean, some shitty jobs in New York and living with my parents. And, you know, really those years in New York from like age 22 to 24. Yeah. You referenced them earlier. You said miserable years. Yeah, they were, ho- they were awful years, really awful years. Oh, I can't even believe I survived those years. Mm. They were terrible. Mm. Oh my God. And I had to take the express bus into the city, which nauseated me. Start again, <laughs> stop again, start again, stop again. <laughs> you know, that bus kind yes, of stuff. Yes, yes, yes. But then I started recovering. And then when I came out to L.A. in 1985, I was gaining a little bit of weight in New York, slow, very, very little and slowly. When I came out here, I was turned on to Overeaters Anonymous. And that really helped me. Yeah. That really helped me a lot. Yeah. Yeah, I'm lucky. I'm one of the lucky ones yes. because it's a killer disease. It really is. It really is. And I can't wait to see your show. It's going to be amazing. Thank you. Yeah. It's called, Does This Show Make Me Look Fat? Oh, it's such a good title. It's a good title. I hope the show's as funny as the title. It will be. It will be. It already is. I'll be there. I'll be front row. Oh, thank you. So, Kathy, we've come to the time in the interview where- We have already? Yes. Oh, my God. I know. It flies, right? So, I ask every guest the same three questions, and okay. then I go into a lightning round of questions. Okay. You may remember this from the I do, episodes. but okay. I forget what they are now okay. because I'm ancient. Yes. <laughs> what do you think about, Kathy, when you hear the word MILF? Well, mother, I love to fuck. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 I love that you said mother I'd love. Oh, I mean, I it's think just it's mom, me like? I think it's mom I'd like to. Oh. Oh, okay. But well, the I way like, that well, you I said it better. is much better. Yeah, it's nicer. And you said it, mother I love to fuck. So it's like present tense. No, it's... I said, I, I think I said I'd. Oh, okay. I okay. did say I'd. I don't want to. Okay. Own that okay. incorrectly. Yeah, okay. Mother, I'd love to. That's just so much more respectful. <laughs> it is more respectful. It's less so, ogling and more amorousness. Yes, there. yes, yes. I like that. What is something you've changed your mind about recently? Mm, boy. Oh, that's tough. <laughs> that's really tough. Um, something I've changed my mind about recently. It can be something small. It doesn't have to be. I think I've changed my mind, although it's 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 more of a continuum. It's not like I'm, it's not I'm, I'm not completely flipped on it, but I've made a decision to not expect myself to be perfect. Oh, yes, it's a tough one. I mean, I, I hate like you know i i have I have a roll on my stomach now, which I don't like, but. I'm 63 years old. I'm in pretty good shape. You're in phenomenal shape. And um, I'm not going to look like I did in my 30s. Yeah. And I think I'd like to let that go Mm. of needing to look like I'm 35. Mm. Yeah. Well, 
Yeah, and and it's something that I think it, the messaging that we get and this. I mean, I was at um, lunch yesterday at the Beverly Hills Hotel, and I came around the corner. And this happens frequently in LA. And mm-hmm. I came around the corner, and there was a woman sitting on the couch, and she had this long, long, striking kind of reddish brown hair, and she turned to look at me. I don't know how old this woman was. I could never know how old this mm-hmm. woman was. She had so many injectables in her face. Oh my god! So much makeup on, but I could tell underneath all of that that she was pretty or that she once was pretty right she had pretty features a pretty nose pretty eye shape you know and she just looked up at me and i just thought oh my god like why it's so sad it makes you look worse i know like it'd be better you know i mean easier said than done and i do all the things i buy all the creams i do the thing you know right i haven't gotten botox in a while because i hit my head and i had a lump on my head so i'm like behind on my botox but i get a little botox here and there okay but there's something, it just, I don't know what it is if if you get overzealous with that stuff, but it's like it becomes, it, it makes the women look older. Yeah, it, it does. Because, I mean, you look at somebody like that and you know they're older. Yeah. You know they're older and they look weird. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I have, you know, I'm I'm really falling here, like like on the sides I'm of my... I'm starting to get the thing, thing under my chin. And, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to go down that slippery slope. I really don't. I do get my eyebrows done. And that to me is everything. You get them just, waxed? No, I get them, um, I get microblading. Oh. I get them filled in because they really got thin. Oh, nice. They in look fact, great. I, I just did them so they have a, like a little bit of ointment on them, sort of a little shiny maybe. They look so but, good. I was actually admiring them earlier. Oh, thank I was you. like, God, the shape of her eyebrows is great. Well, and like the thickness. They and, make yeah. a big, it makes a big difference in the shape of one's face. And that is something that I'm really happy that I've done. Yeah. But a facelift Oof. is not something I, I, will do and you even, can't and know. even this eye is falling here i mean unless it starts to impair my vision right i i'm not going to do yeah. anything about it yeah. i mean um I and mean, i know i i notice it like way more than anybody yeah, i else. never would have no possibly, i know yeah but um you know i i don't want to be one of those people i i really i love my gray hair yeah. you know i i want to be who i am yeah well, and you've worked hard to overcome all these things that you just told us about. Right. The, you know, really wanting to be a stand-up comedian and then finally doing it. Mm-hmm. And then having the eating disorder and struggling with that and mm-hmm. then finally getting well from it. Right. So it's like to then deny who that person is. Right. So I applaud that. It's yeah, hard. But it, I still want to lose five pounds. I still... <laughs> You know, there's still a part of me that of says course. Of course. five pounds will change everything. Of course. Well, then it's balance. <laughs> and old habits die hard. I'm, yes. I'm, I'm right yes. there with you. How do you define success? I think doing what one loves and being able to live a decent lifestyle. I mean, not being, I don't think one has to be a millionaire or rich, but just be able to afford to live a nice life, not agonize over your bills, just to be able to smoothly go along, pay what you need to pay and do what you love. Mm. That to me is is successful. Mm. Okay. Lightning round. Okay. Ocean or desert? Ocean. Favorite junk food? I don't eat a lot of junk food, but I would say potato chips. Mm. Any particular kind? Um, no. Just, I mean, just a good potato chip. Yeah. I mean, it, and it really... Um, I don't let myself eat them very often, but I love them. Movies or Broadway show? Oh, God. Oh, man. <laughs> it's like well, Sophie's I choice. love the movies, yeah. but and, I, and they're so much more accessible to me. But Broadway shows are so special to me. I just saw one when I was in New York What'd last week. I saw The Ferryman. Oh, how it was, was it? It was really good. It was really good. Mm. Great theater. Great theater. I miss that. Yeah, I I miss that a lot, a lot. So yeah, Broadway show is just just like you know very yeah. special. Yeah, daytime sex or nighttime sex? It doesn't really matter to me what day what time of day it is. I, yeah, daytime is kind of fun, I guess. Yeah, and then you get dressed and you get, you move on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I already know this, but cat person or dog person? Oh God, dog person. Have you ever worn a unitard? Yes. I have. What color was it? It was black, of yeah. course. Yeah. Yes. It was cat. We called it a cat suit. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. 
It was in style in the 80s. Oh, yeah. It's come back. Yeah, it oh, has. Yeah. Well, I'm not, I won't be wearing one. Me neither. <laughs> uh, shower or bathtub? Uh, shower. Ice cream or chocolate? Chocolate. On a scale of one to ten, how good are you at ping pong? Um, eight. Nice. What is your biggest pet peeve? People who don't say thank you. If you could push a button and have perfect skin for the rest of your life, but it would also give you incurable halitosis for the rest of your life, would you push it? No. <laughs> your face. No. She was horrified God, when I no. said hal- incurable halitosis. Superpower choice. Invisibility, ability to fly, or super strength? I think ability to fly. That would be great. That would be pretty awesome. And it would beat the traffic. Oh. oh, that would be great. And I could go to New York whenever I wanted. Oh, yeah, ability to fly. Would you rather have, this is the one weird question, Okay, six fingers on both hands or a belly button that looks like foreskin? <laughs> wow. She's repulsed. <laughs> a belly button that looks like foreskin. Well, this I'm kind of cheating here, but I would say the belly button that looks like foreskin because I, then I know I could have that surgically removed. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> what was the name of your first pet? Honey Bun. What was the name of the street you grew up on? Morency. Morency so your, Lane. Your porn name is Honey Bun Morency. Oh, wow. She is, she is up scale. That's good. Yeah. Honey Bun Morency. <laughs> She's fun. She was a showgirl, I think. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think oh, she yeah. was a showgirl. Oh, yeah. oh, my God, your dog is so cute. I know, he is so cute. Honey Bun Morency. What do you think of that, Chappie? Oh, He's my He's so baby. precious. Oh, my baby. He's so precious. Mm-hmm. Kathy, you're miraculous. Thank you so much oh, for being on the so show. Oh, you're so nice. This was wonderful. Oh, I had a great time. Thank you. You're great. I Thank can't believe you. how the time flew. I know. It goes so fast. All right, now let's go on to the next thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks so much for listening, guys. I really hope you enjoyed my conversation with Kathy. Tune in next week for a fresh episode of MILF Podcast. Moms I'd like to follow anytime, anywhere. I love you. Keep going. <laughs>